Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Meeting House Church. We're so glad that you're joining us today. My name is George Dornbach, and I'm the Children and Families Associate here at Meeting House Church. We've got a lot of fun things going on in our department, especially every Sunday. Uh, we'll have God's Garden, our Sunday experience for kids nursery age through fifth grade. And every other Wednesday, we'll be doing a tour de parcs through the Southwest Metro. So a new park each Wednesday. Feel free to bring a picnic, uh, bring some friends, or just yourself. We'll be there. Uh, and then we'll also be doing a half-day summer camp here at Meeting House Church, which will happen at the end of August, and registration is open for that as well right now. When the fall starts again, we'll continue our weekly Wednesday night programming featuring voices from within our community. There's lots of music, lots of play, exploration, and creating together. Now, all of this info and more can be found on our website, meetinghouse.church. Now, before the service begins, I wanted to take a minute uh, to help orient you to worshiping with us online. Check out the description below to find helpful links for you to get the most out of our service today. You'll find PDFs uh, of our handouts, links to learn more about our community, and even more ways to you know, submit prayer requests. If you'd like to get more connected in our community or get connected for the first time, text CONNECTMC to 55498. And one of us on staff will personally follow up with you. Now, as we're getting ready uh, to get started this morning, feel free to send a message in the chat and let us know where you're joining us from today. And from all of us here at Meeting House Church, welcome.
Good morning and welcome to Meeting House Church. Here's the good news. No matter how you have come today, if you're here in person or online, whatever you're carrying into the life of this church today, God is here for you. God wants to carry you and lift you and empower you and send you out. As we come together in worship, hear these words of comfort and encouragement for a day like today. From Matthew 11, it says, Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The God who made that promise is here for you this day. Welcome to worship. Let us sing together. and bring our hearts together as a moment given to us in each worship service where we get a chance to pray together. Let's pray. <clears throat> Living God, whose breath has brought us life, we give thanks to you for this day. We give thanks to you for your spirit who blows where she will often calling into question our most cherished assumptions, asking us to trust in the new ways and the new world that you are bringing into being. It is by your spirit, O oh God, that we not only live, but live the new life that you call us into in the midst of a world marked with violence and death. 
This day, O oh God, we cry out for your spirit to sow peace in our world, in our communities, and in our own lives. We are torn apart by hatred, by warfare. We are divided by vile ideologies. We ravage your world by our own thoughtlessness. Forgive us for the ways that we have not been open to your quiet voice, for the ways that we do not love others, whether in word or deed, or in the lack thereof. We pray, O oh God, this day, especially for the people of Buffalo, as they grieve lost lives, and for our black and brown siblings who have been especially shaken and affected by the violence perpetrated there. Let your words of healing speak into their lives, but also give all people of goodwill the resolve to turn from the stupidity of racism to the wisdom of fellowship and common humanity. We think also of all those who are forced to flee the violence of warfare, whose lives have been upended by ecological disaster, and whose existence is made precarious by greed. Comfort them, O oh God. Cover them. Be with them. Grant those, O oh Lord, who are given authority wisdom, but also move them to make decisions that are aimed at peace and life. Lord, this day we lift up to you the church, your people around the world, and we pray that you will not only be present to all people of faith and goodwill, but that you will especially unify our witness to the way of your son Jesus, who spent his life in service to his neighbor and in faithfulness to you. We pray also for our community, Meeting House Church. Lord, we need you to be present here. We need you to be leading us. Give us the ears to hear and the eyes to see where you are leading us so that we might discern how we might be and become even more a people of your welcome in our time and in our place. Lord, you are the great physician. You are the one who bears our burdens. And so we lift up to you especially the, the special needs of our congregation. We lift up to you all those who are sick, those who are in need of healing, and those who are preparing to go into, into surgery, including especially David Yates, Jerry Seavers, Eleanor Westberg, Steve Lindsay, and all those whom we hold in our hearts. Spread out your healing hand over all those in need and over their families, and be present to the physicians and the communities that will surround them as they move through this time of trial. Lord, we give thanks to you this day for the birth of Noah James Gomez Pickard, born to Lanny and Jorge, and to grandparents Charlie and Donna Pickard. We thank you for the gift of little Noah, and we look forward to who he will become and how he will bless this world. We also pray for the family of Noel Pittman, for the family of Edie Norquist, and for Jenny Anderson at the death of her sister Kay, Cookie Kurtz. We grieve with our brothers and sisters and we join them in commending their loved ones into your care and your eternal embrace. May they know your peace in this time of their grief. And we also celebrate this day, O oh God, the memory of Jean Holderness in whose honor today's flowers are given, 
And we join with Susie and her family in giving thanks for Gene, for his love, and all that he has meant to so many. And in all of these things, we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into trial, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Thank you so much for that beautiful song, that beautiful uh, choral response. And to the, to the chorale who's sitting out in the audience, thank you so much for this entire year leading us and giving us guidance as we worship together and sing together and join our voices together. How's it going? Good. I, every now and then you got to ask that question. Come on. We're at, the end, we're at the end of the school year. There's probably kids that are excited about that. Uh, all kinds of interesting things that are going on. Uh, I, a couple of uh, announcements that I have. The first is I just want to do a little recap. We had a really uh, phenomenal gathering together uh, on Wednesday from 5.30 till, I don't, what did they, when did they close? Like 8.30 or 9? I wasn't able to, to shut it down uh, myself. I had to leave a little earlier, but uh, they were going for a while. This was the uh, swing into summer Recap, there was food, there were root beer floats, there was a 17-piece swing band. People were out there cutting a rug on the floor. Um, uh, some of our mission partners were there. We had a chance to, uh, to, to do a little service project. So it was just a, an absolute blast. And uh, I, I hope that you were able to be there. And, and thanks also to all those who were able uh, not only to come, but to help organize, to serve, and to make it such a successful um, and wonderful event that really blessed our community. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, there are going to be uh, some additional gatherings this summer, uh, times when we're going to get a chance to get together. Uh, as that's, we're going to make you aware of that basically through uh, the different kind of organs of, of dissemination of our propaganda, I guess. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going into academic mode, so uh, I'm getting a little bit, obviously I'm getting a little bit nervous. Organs of dissemination. Um, uh, basically, check out our e-news. Uh, check out what we're doing on the website, uh, on Facebook, on Instagram, of course, uh, in the bulletin. You'll also hear about that. Uh, but we're excited about finding ways to stay connected during the summer uh, as we're all kind of you know, going on our vacations, enjoying, enjoying the weather, etc. cetera. Uh, last announcement is that the next two weeks we will be meeting together. 
uh, as one church. So as you know, there is a, a second service, which is, uh, or another service, which is one of the multiple expressions uh, of worship that we have here. And the next two weeks, we will be together. Next week, we will all be together in here in the meeting house. And then the week after, we will all be together in the great hall. So I wanted to just... Uh, make you aware of that. Uh, and it'll be a chance to kind of come together uh, and, and be a single community and worship together in that way. Okay, uh, kids, come forth. Uh, it turns out that George is not here today. I'm not as much fun as George, but I do want to invite you up. Uh, Paul and Kathy are going to lead us through our song. Yeah, so I'll turn are. that over to you guys. That should be fun. Come on down. Let's sing together. Come, oh come, come to the garden, gather round, come get out here, know my name, here in God's garden, all are welcome here. Sounds great, everyone. All right, and as the kids are leaving, we're going to say, have fun, kids. So, one, two, three, have fun, kids. All right, brothers and sisters, building on that energy and excitement as we watch the little folks leave, please stand up as you're able and pass the peace to one another. Good morning. May the Holy Spirit fall upon us as we receive the word of the Lord. Its message, as it did to all the people in this narrative, which Peter recounts in Acts 11. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them, step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. And as I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, By no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. 
But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced. And they praised God, saying, Then God has given even the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God, whose words live and are alive in us. Thank you for that, Lisa. Thank you. Kate Carlson, I, don't, I know you're here somewhere. Thank you for being back with us from school and sharing your music. Uh, that violin just sounds beautiful in this space. We're always glad when you're with us. And I'm just going to give you a heads up. The anthem that follows uh, my sermon is written by Paul Rodoy, our choral director. And it's, uh, I think, the first time we're going to get a chance to hear it. And so I just want you to be mindful of the fact that uh, God, his gifts are going to be shared throughout this meeting house this day, and we're excited to hear it. God, we invite you into this moment as we've opened your word and we are looking expectant for the ways your spirit will guide us. We pray that you will minister to our open hearts even now, for we pray this in your name. Amen. In our passage for today, Peter is in Jerusalem addressing a worried church leadership. The message version of the Bible says that Peter was called on the carpet. They asked, what do you think you're doing rubbing shoulders with that crowd, eating what is prohibited and ruining our good name? Acts 10 actually explains the events leading to Peter's Acts 11 message. Cornelius, a Gentile centurion, had sent for Peter because of a vision he had received when Peter received his vision. News of what was happening was traveling fast, and in no time the leaders in Jerusalem wanted an explanation from Peter about what was going on, what was happening in Caesarea. Peter himself knew he was breaking Hebrew traditions by entering the house of Cornelius, a Gentile. But Peter was following clear leading by God. And the outcome was now calling for a course adjustment for the church. I guess the reality that change is difficult certainly predates us. You're probably aware the Holy Spirit fell on people three different times in the book of Acts. The first, of course, was Pentecost. Not only was Peter present, but he preached the Pentecost sermon. The second was at Samaria. This time, Peter wanted an explanation from Philip about what was happening with Samaritans being baptized. Then the Holy Spirit fell on the Samaritans, and God confirmed that the gospel was for Samaritans and Jews. And now, in Caesarea, 
But what happened at Caesarea was the ultimate stretch for the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. This time, it was Gentiles receiving the gospel. It was a huge deal. Peter himself had changed on this issue based on the vision God had given to him three times. Apparently, he was a slow learner. Three times with the sheets coming down from the sky. And Cornelius' vision then reinforced it was God at work. As a result of Cornelius' household coming to faith, the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles there. The same way the Spirit fell on the believing Jews on that Pentecost day in Jerusalem. In today's passage, Peter explains how Gentiles received the gospel at Caesarea. Peter explained his reluctance to enter the house of, the gen of a Gentile, but it was clear. It was clear that God had led him. It was clear God wanted him to go. But the question of the Jerusalem leadership was still before Peter. What do you think you were doing? Rubbing shoulders with that crowd, eating what is prohibitive, ruining our good name. You see, church leadership had clear rules and boundaries that guided their work and understanding of who was in and who was out of God's favor. And this was messing it up. By the grace of God, the apostles and priests who were asking Peter to explain himself finally realized, finally realized what was happening. Was this not God's plan from the very beginning? God called Abraham to be a blessing to all the families of the earth, which we can read in Genesis 12. And so their hearts were opened and their eyes began to see. It began to make sense to them and they began praising God for what was happening. You see, once what was lost was now being found throughout the world. But they had come a long way to get there. To realize that there was room at God's table for all. The result of this message was a dramatic shift. The persecuted believers scattered because of Stephen's martyrdom had received a new revelation. What God has made clean, you shall not call profane, was the word. Now, they're called to preach God's love and mercies to all, even the Gentiles. The early church leaders finally began to understand what Jesus said to them the very last time they saw him. Jesus' final words to them were, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the very ends of the earth. Peter was among those who heard those words. And he even believed those words, at least at some level. But the full impact of what those words meant didn't fully sink in at that time. But they were now. All truly means all when God speaks. This was a call to do something Peter had never done and had never imagined doing. Taking the gospel message to the Jews in Jerusalem and Judea, sure, that, that might make some sense. But to Samaria, those ethnic and spiritual half-breeds as the Jews considered them to be, there was no room at the table for them. No way. To the ends of the earth, really? This would mean reaching out to people who were, who are so different. People the likes of whom none of the disciples had ever met or cared about. This would be hard. They'd have to cross the road, overcome differences, have an open heart, actually listen, and then lead 
with love. This would need to be a Holy Spirit thing. Thank God for God's Spirit. At the time, Peter didn't think about all this. But he was thinking about it now. Peter was in a Judean town of Joppa, hosted by a tanner by the name of Simon. Peter went up on the flat roof of Simon's house to pray, as he always did. The noonday sun was upon Peter as he prayed. We don't know what he prayed, likely routine and ordinary, like many of my own prayers. But suddenly, things became unordinary. Peter tells us what happened next. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance, I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners. And it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. The sheet was filled with all kinds of animals. Some Peter, some Peter recognized as being clean and kosher according to the laws. However, mixed in with them were several unclean animals. Animals no devout Jew would even touch, let alone eat. So the directive following the vision came as a shock. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. What? No. This has to be a mistake. But God was very clear. To make the point, God repeated the vision two more times. Peter, you've got to get this. We don't fully get it because we aren't first century Christians. But this was very difficult for Peter. It was a dismantling of religious traditions and laws that were thousands of years old. It would mean abandoning the clarity Peter's people had celebrated for generations. It was some of the things that set them apart from their neighbors. This was an unraveling of centuries of Jewish religious thoughts about beliefs, about rituals, about traditions that would offer inclusion now to the family of God. The family boundaries were changing. I'm sure you figured it out by now that this whole exchange was never really about food. It was about challenging Peter and all the Jewish followers of Jesus to redefine what it means to be part of God's family. To understand who God wanted to be included now at the table. It was a call to let go of things that had served as a fence of protection around their identity. Would they or could they choose to rely on God's grace in this circumstance? It took three times for the message to sink in to Peter, to sink in for Peter to understand what it meant for the church, to realize that things were going to get messy if they followed this path. But our passage suggests this is precisely what God wanted. Our passage indicates that God wants things to be unimaginable for us, messy and uncomfortable, and deliberate acts of faith when it comes to the church's work. A knock at the door came while Peter was still thinking about all of this. Simon the Tanner answered and shouted up to the roof. Peter's haze was broken, probably by words like, there are some guys from Caesarea here to see you. They said God sent them. They told him why they were there. They shared that Cornelius had told them that he had seen an angel standing in his house, which told him to 
send to Joppa and bring Simon Peter, and he will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, and you and all your household. And so the messiness begins. These men, these outsiders, these Gentiles stayed at Simon the Tanner's house. They were his guests overnight. People in the town must have not known what to think. Can you believe the Tanner would have those people stay at his house? The following day, Peter and six other Jewish Christians left with those servants of Cornelius to go to the fringes. The fringes of Judea, the peripheries of the faith, to the edge of their comfort level. Cornelius was a God-fearer, a good and prayerful guy, but he still was a Gentile, and his family were Gentiles, and he was a centurion in the Roman army as well. So it took a complete paradigm shift for Peter and his entourage to go, to go and even eat with them. They probably ate some unkoshered foods. With this simple act, suddenly the mission became real. It was no longer an idea, a thought, or a prayer. It was happening. Suddenly the world opened up. Suddenly the picture God had for the mission and the ministry of the church is coming into focus. This is what it looks like, people. Very different people around one table together celebrating what Jesus has done in his death and resurrection. A beautiful preview of Revelation 7 was coming together. From Revelation 7, heaven where a great multitude that no one could number from every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's what heaven's supposed to look like. Let's start practicing it now. For Peter, this was going to be complicated. This wasn't going to be so clear cut or easy to define. This would have to be a God thing, a faith thing. Or as one commentary said, a let's go as far as we can see and see what we can see from their thing. Let me say that again. A let's go as far as we can see and see what we can see from there. God didn't tell him how everything would go or how it would all work out, no. God just gave him, them the promise. The promise that the Holy Spirit would be with them. And that was all they needed. That was all they needed? Hmm. Is that all I need? Is that all you need? Is it all this church needs? Is that enough? The promise of the Spirit? Is that enough to motivate us to step into uncharted spaces, unfamiliar relationships, and well beyond our comfort? Is that enough? God was faithful in Caesarea with Cornelius' household in our passage. The Holy Spirit moved in unique ways among them. This whole Gentile family was baptized, and the family of God grew in unexpected ways that day. The world and God's kingdom just exponentially expanded. There was a lot to celebrate if you could celebrate there was a lot for which to be happy. God's grace and mercy was going out to the rest of the world. But not everyone was happy. 
Word spread fast and many were upset. So many tightly held beliefs and systems, the things they counted on were shaken. What were they to think? What could they trust if not their long-held religious beliefs? Change is hard. And some didn't like the changes God was proposing. God was ruining everything. God wasn't letting them control their lives, let alone who got to sit at the table anymore. God was uprooting the tall, safe hedges of laws and traditions that effectively created a boundary between the us and the them. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the church leaders criticized him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them? Many of those leaders loved the old rules, the old ways. They were among those who taught that those old Jewish rules were necessary for salvation. These folks loved their traditions so much, they wanted people to go backward, to have a faith that looked more and more like the faith that God was calling them from. But it's hard to blame them, isn't it? It's hard and sometimes even scary to hear new ideas and possibilities, and then in turn be open to them? To change when the old ways work just fine. The old ways work just fine. It was undoubtedly easier the old way for them to have clear lines and differences. If this indeed was God's leading, life was gonna get even more complicated. Ministry was going to get unpredictable, uncomfortable, and likely a bit chaotic. This passage hits a little too close to home for me. I can relate to these church leaders. I like predictability. I celebrate traditions and the things with which I am comfortable with. I have defended and exerted great energy toward things I now realize God doesn't care about at all. I probably have let myself to things that even get in the way of God's plans at times. All in the name of me. What I like, what I'm comfortable with, and how I think things should be. As the church, we can fight so hard over things that are so unimportant at times. Things that we will defend at all cost. The church needs to ponder whether we are keeping the main things, the main things from time to time. To pause and reflect and wonder and listen to the Spirit. Listen to whether or not we are using our energies to expand God's kingdom or build larger fences to protect what we have. There are all kinds of things that God doesn't care about. All sorts of things that Jesus did not come into the world for. What Jesus did come for, or whether who Jesus came for, is clear. Jesus came into the world to offer his love to people like you and me and so many others, all the rest. He came to save us all from ourselves so that we might know that we are unconditionally loved by a powerful yet forgiving, holy and yet merciful God. And we, church, we are to live Likewise, in all the world around us. Thank God the early church recognized the work of the Spirit. I'm grateful for their testimony as they followed the Holy Spirit and not their desires for comfort and neatness. Following the Holy Spirit meant awkwardness, discomfort, letting go of self, and then holding on for dear life to God 
as God leads in ever-changing ways. What Peter reported to the leaders in Jerusalem, they were shocked at first, just like everyone else. But when they heard these things, they fell silent. But then they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. The table gets larger more and more invited to it. Do we know that God is still calling the church today? That God calls us to resist complacency? That God causes us to be uncomfortable, live in messiness, and even love it? And celebrate it? That's what the scripture says. Friends, our mission is to risk being uncomfortable because our mission is, and you know this, you know this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and it doesn't stop there, and your neighbor as yourself. And remind them that there's room at the table, our table, for everyone. I don't know all of the doors God may still open for this church. But together, let's go as far as we can see to go right now. And then mustering all of our faith, trusting that God will lead, step out. Let's you and I take a chance to see what God might do what God is doing. Because if we're willing, we will be joining a long line of Jesus followers who followed where God directed, even when they didn't know exactly to whom it would lead or what things would look like when they got there. Church, it has never been easy. It's always required faith, reliance upon God, and a trust in the leading of the Spirit as the church seeks to create a space at God's table, our table, for all. Can I get an amen? amen? Let's pray. God, we hear these words. These are challenging words. They are words about your people. They are words about the church. They are words about you, God, who came to us, to us all that we might practice how we will dwell in eternity here in this world with each other. So God, help us to tear down those fences that keep us apart. Help us to cross that road, literally and figuratively, to the world that's out there. Bless us as we seek to be faithful. Forgive us when we fall short. Empower us as we need it to do your good work here and literally around the world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Corral. I absolutely love this last line, Paul. Love makes all things new. Thank you for that marvelous reminder. As we now prepare to move into a moment of generosity, I'd like to invite Michelle. Come on up here. Thank you. I'm Michelle Moser, and I serve on the Generosity Ministry Action Team. We've been collecting stories of generosity for a while. I have another letter to read to you guys from a member of our congregation. They've chosen to remain anonymous, like so many have. Uh, this letter is called My Thoughts on Generosity from Anonymous. I'm not the richest person in the world, but I don't, need, I don't need to compare myself to anyone else to know how rich I really am because I have been abundantly blessed by God. To live in this country, to live in this state, to live in this time in history, to be healthy, to have a good job, and I know I want to give back because of this abundant blessing. I know that being generous to others and to the church makes a big difference. I am an aspiring tither, that's in quotes, aiming for the 10% giving goal. I am not there yet, but I am getting close. Last year I doubled my monthly offering and I wasn't sure I would be able to sustain it, but it's worked out great so far. I have to admit it is a bit scary calculating the dollar amounts to get to what 10% means. There go my first fruits, I say. But I do feel joyful giving this money away. It's God's money, really, not mine at all. It feels like such an honor to be able to give a portion of my income to this church each month. I think it's true that every penny counts, and when those pennies get combined, amazing things happen. I like that my gift gets pooled with everybody else's, and this collective offering magnifies God's work. I like that my gift pays a portion of the staff's salaries and helps them support their families. I like that my gifts keep the lights on so that others can come into this fine building. I like that my gift helps the choir make great music. I like that my gift provides snacks and activities and camps for the kids so they have a safe place to learn about God. And these kids are inviting their friends and neighbors to join them. I like that my gift helps with missional work so that people outside of our walls can experience God's love. I appreciate how this church does weddings and funerals and holidays and prayer. I appreciate how this church chose to get messy with changing our name and asking the tough questions and being okay with differing opinions and so much more. Thank you for reading my letter and I just want to close with saying I'm all in Meeting House Church. Sincerely, Anonymous. <laughs> if anyone else would like to share their thoughts on generosity with GMAT, we will share them anonymously, or you can share it yourself publicly, too. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. As we think about uh, generosity, and as we think about... Um, Going as far as we can see and seeing what we can see from there, that letter really embodies that because it's not easy always to give. As you think for yourself about um, how you can be generous, remember two things. One, it's not just about money. It's about your time and your talents. Your presence it makes a huge difference in the life of our community and in how we can be generous, not just here, but beyond our walls. And second, that God loves a cheerful giver, someone who feels free in that sense of giving. So know that God is looking for you to feel free to embrace that. If you decide that you want to support the continuing ministry of our church, you can certainly go online, you can text, uh, and we also have uh, a, an offering box just out in the North Commons. So let me pray for our, our gifts and our offerings uh, together. Lord, we thank you that you are indeed the giver of all good gifts, that you have given us life, you have given us breath, you have given so many things that enrich our world and ourselves. Take these small tokens that we bring back to you, 
these things that you have laid on our hearts that you've made possible for us to give and multiply them to the glory of your name and to the good of our neighbor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much, Michelle. Brothers and sisters, I invite you to rise as you're able to sing our closing hymn, When in Our Music God is Glorified, number 641. a good way to end that song. Hallelujah. How many of you know that God is faithful? How many of you trust that God is faithful? Then God is faithful. God is faithful, which means when God invites, when God directs, when God urges, when God sends, God's faithfulness goes with us. It is scary, it is messy, it is overwhelming, but God is faithful and God is with us. Let us be about expanding the kingdom of God and welcoming others to the great table, to the great banquet. It's been a good day to be in worship together. I hope that it's been your good experience as well as you've gathered with us online. You are most welcome. We don't have to go home right away. We can stay for a Christian's class as we continue to think about how we can live missionally, crossing the bridge to live missionally. One of our old friends, Reverend John Goods, who did great work with International Justice Mission, is going to be here and sharing some of the work that he has done. He's worth hearing. He tells a good story. So go out into the common, get some coffee, have two or three donut holes, Introduce yourself to someone you don't know and then head down the, to the Great Hall for our last class of the year. So go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, remembering God's faithfulness.
Thank you.